I'm going to step through just a couple little things to watch out for with that manual one. I see it still just kind of made its way through. Um, something that's important with it is if you look up here on the screen, the coupler where it goes up, it actually threads that coupler onto that relief valve and then that jam nut, which is actually what would normally lock that relief valve at that point of where you've set it, that jam nut is actually being turned back to the coupler and then that uh, jam together so that we can ensure that the motor can actually turn that uh, valve spool in and out. So it's being jammed together and then you're using the actual set screw to lock it down. So something to keep in mind on those older models, that is a point of interest, I guess, with uh, some troubleshooting questions that I went over in past and, and it's something I wanna make sure you guys know about. So from there, this is probably the most commonly asked question is, uh, you know, contamination. So contamination on any hydraulic valve is generally uh, due to hookups, dirty hookups, things along that line. And uh, it's something that we always want to make sure that we have clean wiring hookups, we have clean hydraulic hookups, and that from there, um, the cleaner we are, the less likely we are for contamination or downtime. So uh, with PWM valves operating meter motors and shank pressures and bypass valves and stuff like that, we always want to make sure we're keeping things as clean as possible. So um, contamination is usually the point of uh, the first thing that we always want to fight against. And uh, a common question every spring, just to give you a taste of troubleshooting here before lunch, is um, a customer phones. This is probably one of the most commonly quest uh, asked questions with the toolbar. Customer phones says, I cannot build shank down pressure. And uh, initially, there's a few things we want to check out to make sure it's being operated right before we say, oh, pull that relief valve out and let's just check it and see. We want to do a few things more than that. We want to actually be sure that it is that. And uh, I'll give you that scenario and uh, then we'll have lunch. So basically the first off, we hooked up uh, the tractor. So we go to that customer's place uh, and uh, initially you want to say, okay, well, we should be proactive, right? We want to be sure that everything is hooked up correctly, everything is flowing correctly. So we go first off, we check the connections at the back of the tractor, red and green are hooked together. The unmarked lines for the shank raise and lower are hooked together. We then know what remotes those are on uh, when we get back to the tractor cab. From there, we should always do double check that that dump line is uh, connected and that there's no restrictions in the way and uh, double check the wire connections. You know, if it's an older one, I've pointed out, we could have simple things that the wires are just connected incorrectly, or maybe it was uh, a dirty hookup because he was just stuck here before and it was all full of mud. So um, making sure those connections are clean, properly connected are a key. And then from there, we can go up to the tractor and uh, activate the, the red and, or the remote that has the red and green lines on it and uh, from there we know that the green line is the one that's being pressured up to actually give us system pressure so then we can be a little proactive and make sure okay he has it set to constant that's right he has his flow control set that it's operating in between uh, 25 and 2900 but uh, we also are double checking that because it's your guys' tractor that it's not set too high that it's in standby relief too. So keeping that in the back of your mind. So from there, we see that the wing down pressure, who remembers what it should be at when they have system pressure. From there, um, when we have zero on that, we know that circuit's flowing correctly. So that's great. So from there, we lift the openers up and we'll put them back down. And from there, we know that that is hooked onto the tractor correct. We want to double check his flow because we said it should be about three quarters of, of the flow. We'd never want it maxed at full demand. And uh, from there, we can uh, raise the openers up, setting the actual timer to make sure that those are, are set correctly so they cut out. Now, the gain with that is that uh, you can see if it was set up correctly. So this customer had it set up perfectly, so that's good. Uh, from there, we, uh, we wanna just take and double check 
what the actual wing down pressure. Well, it was in, you guys did a PDI on it before it went out. The wing down's pressure is set to 150 for that 70 foot machine, so that's perfect. So we can continue on. So we've ruled out just to make sure the main portions are operating correctly. It takes that long to make sure. So at that point, with the openers are up, we remember we lifted them up and double checked the timer is correct. We simply turn on the opener pressure switch. So uh, if you remember the cruiser, utilizing the foot pedal switch, turns on the opener pressure. So when that's turned on, it actually powers up the wiring because we've double checked it's connected. So we should be able to see that there's power back here. One other thing I want to make sure you guys know is that all of our solenoids have DIN blocks on them. So DIN blocks, our DIN blocks actually have red LED lights in there. So these are very visual, uh, visual, so you can actually see that there's power on it. So you want to make sure that you have power. So you can absolutely see that from the tractor cab that there's power there. So with that, we see that it lights up and uh, then we know we have power going to that solenoid. So for instance, uh, as soon as you turn that on, because our system pressure is active, the opener started going down. I'll, sh I'll tell you what that's just verified. One, we know we have power. Second, there's a light so you can see you have power. So then we're powering up this solenoid uh, here, which then we know because of the flow of oil, it has actually opened that on off valve, that one I passed around to you guys, and it supplied the oil from the system pressure through that valve. It has gone through the orifice, which is controlling the flow, and that the ball valve on the back of the block is open and that it has allowed the openers to go down. So we know that th that top row of uh, valving is working properly. So just by simply having the openers up and turning the opener pressure on, we know we have power, the flow of oil is going through, it's going through the orifice, the ball valve at the back is for sure open and those openers are starting to go down. So we know that all of that is set up correctly. So then from there, um, we want to make sure we're now ruling out what that customer said. So uh, he said he could not build shank down pressure. So we know everything else is hooked up correctly, the flows are right, and uh, that when we turn on the opener pressure, because they go down, we have a, a supply of oil. From there, we look, pass that PWM valve around, which um, from there is then uh, reading on the monitor that it reads uh, a PWM value, say 190 what it had in that other, um, image that we looked at. So we can then uh, re look back at the actual block. Again, it has power on the actual coil. So that solenoid there, again, because we're getting a value, we want to make sure it for sure is there. And uh, again, a little LED light and a DIN block proves that we have power at the PWM. So again, something else you can see. So from there, we can actually put it into manual mode. So this is where you guys uh, uh, would see that possibly the customer is operating in, a, in an auto mode. So then that's where the whole point of coming and setting it into a manual mode is nice. So you can set it into a manual mode and you can increase the pressure and decrease that pressure. And uh, as we increase it and decrease it, uh, the number changes on the screen showing that the power is changing and that the coil is trying to change it, but it's simply not registering on the actual gauge. So from there, then we're up against that PWM valve to know that it must not be actually moving. So I pointed out that we do have a manual override on it. So if you don't want to pull it out, first you can actually loosen the jam nut and actually force it in, closing it, increasing the pressure and turning it in and out. Maybe that can be enough just to free up uh, a little bit of contamination. It could be holding that valve and uh, Worst case scenario, you can't. So after doing that, you've increased it and decreased it by physically turning it in and out. What we then are up against is that then we'd have to shut everything else off because we still haven't got the pressure. So we float out the remotes on the tractor, relieving all the pressures because we know we have the gauges on every side of the, each circuit. It's one for diagnose, but it's also for you guys' safety. So we can know that all the pressure is off on that system and uh, at that point using the remote on the tractor to float it making sure they are off 
always shut the tractor off. If you don't know that customer as a 35 years standing friend, even if you do, is it worth the risk? Probably not. So something to keep in mind is that hydraulics are, are dangerous. One, even more dangerous when they're hot. So having the pressures off, shut the tractor off to be sure you're not going to get wet. So from there, then you can actually unhook the actual solenoid, pulling it off the back with the plastic nut there, and then you can actually verify with the gauges there's no pressure. Then you know it's safe to remove that cartridge, which you actually had out and in your hands here a few minutes ago to know there's nothing extra to fall out of that block. And then from there, if you're lucky, you get to find contamination like this. That's uh, a 90% likelihood that you'll never find contamination. So if you find it, it's something like I did, I took a picture of it. So um, with that, it helps with showing you guys what we're looking at. So then with that uh, PWM valve, you can see uh, this is uh, at the very end of it here. You can see that this is where the flow of oil comes from and that when you turn that valve in, it actually is closing off those ports, which is then increasing that pressure. So that's why we have that manual adjustment is also to allow you to decrease that all the way off. And then you can actually plunge the inside barrel of that relief valve to make sure it's clean and free. These valves are all cleanable. You always want to make sure the O-rings are in place. And then from there, you can uh, go ahead once it's clean. With the PWM valve, always make sure it's fully relieved when you're done. So it has the full parameter of what it operates in. So from fully relieved to, to full open to have that parameter uh, movement. If you, uh, if you don't fully relieve it, you're limiting how far that PWM can travel with the actual monitor. There's a, a scenario that uh, comes up. What about if it never did build pressure after? It's an older machine. And uh, at that point, we want to, we need to rule out a few more things. So we ruled all the hookups, wiring, all that stuff all out. But what about if it's an older machine that uh, has quite a few acres and we've done all that and we're sure that that relief valve is clean and working properly. We've even took one more step and replaced it with a new one. And it, if it still doesn't build pressure, what would we be up against? A leaking cylinder possibly. So at that point, um, we need to troubleshoot that and uh, the best way to do that is by putting, uh, lifting the openers up. Once they're all the way up, we would close the ball valves, the one at the tractor, the one at the back of the block and uh, see if any pressure builds on the shank downside. So by chance if it starts to build pressure, where does it build pressure to? And uh, by all luck gone bad, uh, we'll open up the ball valve on the back and we'll, we'll just double check to see what these are corresponding to one another. They've now leveled out. Part of why we want to have shank up and shank down uh, and the ability to read them. So uh, they've balanced out in pressure. So we want to try it again. We lift the shanks up. We know that the shank down gauge went to zero initially. We unhook them off the tractor. They still balance out. At that point then, you're up against a cylinder bypassing and you can read it between the shank up and shank down circuit gauges and uh, then you're going to be uh, at the point of checking for heat. So there's really only one way to find uh, a bypassing cylinder and uh, your best friend will be a heat gun to actually uh, check temperature uh, with a temperature gun. So the, what the next step is, rehook it to the tractor, switch the remote that raises and lowers the, the actual openers to a constant and continually lift them up. That gives us the higher pressure, right to tractor high pressure standby to actually be lifting them then because they're directly from tractor. And uh, once you set it to a continuous flow, it's always going to, to force that through to heat up any cylinders that could possibly be bypassing. So we have our main six cylinders, which are uh, going to be first, second and third row of openers. And then because we have a main bridle, which comes down those two main lines, they actually come through the center of the machine and then Y out for left and right side. So that breaks it up into six main opener cylinders. So from there, you check the temperature on those six, you find one that's hot, say it's the, 
the third rank on the left side. We follow that out cylinder to cylinder to cylinder until you get to one cold one and then it's going to be your last hot one. So um, a story that kind of pertains to that and uh, why it's important that you guys know how to do that as well is that uh, the oil is going to go out of that shank up circuit through the bypassing cylinder and back through the return circuit of it, right? And uh, it's going to heat up all those cylinders in a row because that one is bypassing and that's why the one outside of it is going to be cold because the oil is not going that far and it's not returning back through them. So having uh, the ability to read the temperature is very important 